What's up, everybody? So I'm really excited about something, something that I've been thinking about for a while. I was thinking about what can we create that is really going to impact people and really break it down to the basics. Like, what are the things that pull us out of alignment? What are the things that distract us from our goals and living in truth? It's usually lack of commitment to a routine that align with our goals. Morning routine, evening routine, things that we commit to, promises that we commit to that build confidence in ourselves. So my team and I have created a 30-day challenge and it's called Unlock the Warrior Within. Why did I choose the word warrior? Because we all have the warrior in us. If you're living right now, your family has had to survive and get through some very difficult times for you to be here right now. So you should be grateful that you're here. But you should also understand that you are a resilient, courageous, brave human being. And the problem is a lot of us have forgotten that that we forgot that we have that true warrior essence, that true warrior spirit within us that sometimes just needs to be unlocked and unleashed so that we can actually live in truth and connect to our true purpose in life. Now, sometimes it's not the big things that we need to do. Sometimes we, we, we find ourselves looking for the answers outside of ourselves. Somebody else, a political figure, a parent, a friend, whatever addiction we have that week, our phones, but the reality of it is it all starts with us. Once we empower ourselves with the tools, the knowledge, the self-love, we're able to look at the landscape of life differently. But it all starts with the simple fundamentals. So what we've done is we've created 30-day challenge. It doesn't matter when you start it, but what you're going to get is you're going to get access to a Facebook group. You're going to get the idea here is to stick to the morning routine, which connects, gives you a better connection to your mind, body, and spirit. And then in the evening routine, you're going to do things that are going to allow you to tap in and have a better sleep because the next day starts the night before. So throughout the, the, the 30 days, you're going to be doing a morning routine and an evening routine. And then there's going to be one thing that is going to be different. You may do some sort of decluttering exercise, declutter your, your email or some photos in your phone, reach out to a loved one, a random act of kindness. There's going to be different things for the 30 days. And I really challenge you and invite you to step into this and follow this through because the true warrior spirit, the essence that is in with all within all of us starts with the simple practices, the meditations, the journaling, the gratitude, physical activity, nourishing our bodies, sleep. This is all the holistic approach. And in my mind, this is the best way. If you feel disconnected from the world, if you feel disconnected from your purpose and you feel lost, just bring it down, bring it back, get down to basics and join a group of people that want to do this as well. If you're brand new to the personal development world, great. If you've been listening to this show for a while, you're a veteran in it, but you just need a recalibrate, refresher, let's do it. All right. Unlock the warrior within 30 day challenge. All the information, the link is in the show description or the show notes, wherever you're watching this or listening to this, go check it out. It'll take you to the landing page. You put in your email. And we'll take care of the rest. All right. Love you guys. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to University of Adversity. You guys are going to love today's episode. We have the one and only Hala Taha joining us. She's a podcast powerhouse and man such a great conversation. I've been really looking forward to having her on and you guys, her story, 
She's been through so much adversity and like through with her family, with her, with her career path over the years, she gets knocked down. She gets up, gets knocked down, gets up. And her perspective is just so, it's so powerful and empowering for all of you listeners out there that these failures, these, 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 when you get knocked down, they're just, it's just feedback. They're just lessons. It doesn't define you. Whatever you're going through right now, it will get better. Just understand that you can learn from this. You can grow from this. And Hala and I have an amazing conversation around this whole thing. Tried to ask her things that she hasn't been asked all the time. You know, in the podcast world, we get asked the same questions all the time. And as you guys know, I don't have a lot of set questions. I rarely have any. I just really come from an intuition and I gauge the flow of the conversation that way. Um, but there's certain things that I wanted to ask her that I think you guys will find very, very powerful. So a little bit about her. Hala is the host of the Young and Profiting podcast, which is frequently ranked as number one education podcast across all apps. That's pretty phenomenal. Hala is also the CEO of Yap Media, a full service social media and podcast marketing agency for top podcasters, celebrities, and CEOs generating over 2 million in revenue in the first year. Young and Profitable is what YAP stands for, same as her podcast. She is well known for her engaged following and influence on LinkedIn, and she landed the January 2021 cover of Podcast Magazine. There's a lot more to her, but we'll get into it in the story. She's powerful, and I really, really enjoyed this episode. If you guys are new to the show, if you're just tuning in, Hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening. If you do feel called to do so, leave us a review on Apple. It's greatly appreciated. Or tag us in social media on Instagram. I love seeing that your, what your takeaway was and uh, seeing them pop up in our stories. So much love, you guys. Hala Taha. Enjoy the episode. Hala, welcome to University of Adversity. Super excited to have you on today. I'm really excited to be on here. Yeah, there's... so. You know, obviously in this podcast world, social media world, you, there's a lot of mutual connections, mutual friends. And it's funny how, you know, we all get connected somehow. And you are somebody that I was like, it's funny because we had connected on LinkedIn a couple of years ago and I, we had talked and we were going to connect and you're going to come on the show. But, you know, over the years, we sort of lost whatever. And, you know, as the last year has unfolded. I've noticed a big growth in what you're doing. And I'm like, oh, we talked before. So it's kind of cool. And now we're, you know, finally connecting on the show. And I think it's perfect because your story and what I learned about you from, you know, listening to different episodes and reading up on you is really powerful. And it's got some layers that um, could be really powerful for the audience, for somebody that's going through adversity or struggle or whatever it is. And there was one specific thing that you, I heard in one of your episodes and I was like, okay, we got to start there. And that is around probably something that doesn't get talked about enough. And that is being an Arabic woman in New York post 9-11. Mm. And really the challenges that don't get talked about very often, especially now. There's a lot of conversation around uh, racial inequality, as there should be. But that specific thing really hit me when I heard that. And I was like, wow, I never thought about how that must have been moving forward and how you may have been treated. So I would love to start there mm. and walk us through a little bit on maybe like how it felt before and after and how that sort of paved the way for your journey. Oh my gosh. First of all, thank you for doing your research. I really appreciate I can tell this is going to be a fun interview. So thank you. Um, so so 9-11 happened when I was still in school. You know, I was in middle school. And before 9-11, my family was really respected in the community. I I look back and we were treated like an Italian family or a Portuguese family, like an immigrant family, but we were 
treated equally. You know, I was on the sports teams. I was invited to parties. I was just a regular kid in school and, and treated like a regular kid and was pretty much thriving. I was popular and uh, had a lot of friends and my family, like I said, was accepted. I had other siblings who had went through school. And so our teachers knew my other siblings and there was like a sense of community and everything was great. And my dad was a surgeon. We were a pretty successful family and everything was great. Um, when 9-11 happened, it was devastating. I remember watching that happen and having the blame being put on Arabic people right away. I remember be being so young and and crying and calling up a Z100. So Z100 was like taking callers. And I remember trying to get through, trying to tell, like I wanted to get on the radio and tell everyone like, Arabic people aren't bad. Like, we don't know who did this. We have nothing to do with this. Like, we're good people. I don't, I don't know. Like, it stinks that like some bad apples just basically ruined it for everyone. And that's how I had felt that like, oh my gosh, everyone's gonna hate Arabic people now. And it was true, everyone did. And I remember walking in the hallways and friend, and people who used to be my friends starting to make fun of me and, and call me names or call me a terrorist or call me and my cousins terrorists. Um, I remember being in classrooms and having fights with other students because they were saying really racist things and, and not understanding that you know, there's bad people in every religion. And there's then like, just because some people did something doesn't mean that all of the same religion is bad. And, and quickly, you know, in high school, I got no opportunities, none. Um, I wasn't made fun of. I was, I'm lucky that I'm like cute. And so like, I wasn't like really made fun of or anything like that, but I was really popular in middle school and like in high school, I was just really average in terms of like that kind of stuff. And I had the best voice in school and elementary and middle school. I had a, a solo in every concert. I was always known as the girl with the best voice, like singing voice. I never got any leads in the play in high school. They didn't even let me in the talent show. I didn't make any of the sports teams. I didn't make student council. Uh, like just you name it, a volleyball team, cheerleading team, I would try out for things and I would never make it. And it was because there was like, you know, people in charge and I, either you, you had to know somebody or a lot of it, I think was because they were giving other people opportunities and I was kind of getting discriminated against. I was one of the only brown people in school. It was like me, my cousins that were also Arabic and like there was probably like one Spanish kid and like one black kid like there was it's just a school of white affluent people you know and I was definitely discriminated against in that regard and I know that for a fact only because once I got to college it was completely different in college I was leading the play I was you know captain of my cheerleading team every opportunity I tried for I got because it was based on my talent not on like my skin color or whatever it was or my name and then I also think um, maybe I wasn't as confident as I am now. Maybe there was something about my aura. Maybe it was my internal, like, I, I can't say it was 100% discrimination. I think maybe it was 50-50, like me not being who I am today in terms of my positive attitude. And then also the fact that it was like right after 9-11 and people were still you know, having a bad taste in their mouth about that. And on top of that, I'm not just Arabic, I'm Palestinian. So uh, lots of Jewish kids in my school, when I would say I was Palestinian, they'd be like, what? Palestine doesn't even exist. What are you talking about? And they would tell me that my, that I don't, that my people don't exist and I'm making it up. And like, so and now a lot more people are educated about Palestine. So that doesn't really come up anymore. But back in the day, if you said you were Palestinian, people would be like, what are you talking about? There's no, no such thing. It doesn't exist. That country never existed. You're making it up type of a thing. So that's what it was for me in middle school, high school. Now, the interesting thing is that it turned out to be a huge blessing in disguise. Because by the time I got into college, I was so used to getting rejected. I had no fear of taking risks. I had really thick skin. If I didn't get an opportunity, I was back on the horse in two minutes. And that has proved to be my secret sauce to my success is the fact that I never stay down for long. Even as I went on this journey, I had lots, lots of different obstacles, which we can get into. And I quickly turned everything around. And 
uh, I look back and I'm happy that I had that adversity. I'm happy that everybody told me no, because I think it shaped me and made me appreciate when people did say yes, because that's, I gave my all and everything that I did because I didn't take it for granted when somebody gave me an opportunity. Thank you for sharing that. You know, the, there's, it's, it's, it's hard to imagine because I think there's probably a lot of people who didn't even mean to discriminate, but because of the narrative of what was going on, it's kind of like, oh, watch out. Like, and it's really sad, you know? It is really sad. Especially for, and people don't think about that. People don't think about, you know, young people and, you know, what comes from something like 9-11 and them having to deal with just a lot of like, uh, just a lot of people that don't understand and they just assume everybody's like that. And it's, it's, it's powerful to be able to be able to get through that. And it's something that I think needs more attention. That's why it's something I've never talked about when I heard it. I was like, oh, this is, this is really interesting. And it leads me to my next point around, you talk about, you know, you were, you, you said you were the black sheep of your family. Yeah. And you know, I can relate and I understand, you know, what that means in most cases, as far as it's usually the rebellious one. It's usually the one that's mostly in truth, doesn't believe a lot, lot of the bullshit our family does, love them all, but a lot of them go by, you know, what they think is right versus what they know in their heart is. So what does black sheep in your family mean? Can you define that as far as like what you did? as, as to, to be, to define yourself as that, like some of the actions, some of the behaviors that you had? Yeah. So when I was in college, I got an internship at hot 97 when I, I was 19 years old. And, um, I quickly got promoted to the studio area, which was this like highly coveted, only 13 people had key cards. And I was the center of attention at this radio station, literally in the center of the studios and every single celebrity that walked by would interact with me. So I've literally met every like Rihanna, JLo, Drake, Kanye, Jay-Z, Beyonce. I've met every like hip hop celebrity that you could imagine. Kim Kardashian. And did you have conversations with them? Yes. Yes. I've hung out with them. I've, I've, I used, I was like the coolest 20 year old on the planet (laughs) at that time. So I got this internship at hot 97 and obviously I was enamored by the opportunity and I became Angie Martinez's assistant. So for those of you guys who are not in New York, Angie at the time, she was the voice of New York. She hosted the Angie Martinez show. It was the number one radio show across America. And this was about 10 years ago. So back then, um, that was the uh, biggest radio station in the world. And radio was bigger yeah. than it is now. Yeah. So like, it wasn't like about pod, like podcast didn't even really exist. It was really about radio. So it was a big deal to be in that position. And basically how it works is in radio, you need to pay your dues. So it's all about working for free and basically being an apprentice to all the DJs and the on-air personalities. So I was Angie Martinez's assistant. I didn't get paid by the station. I wasn't a, I was an intern, uh, but I, it was an intern that internship that I got from college that just never ended. So they just never hired me, but I was basically a holla from hot 97 and everybody knew that like I was treated like a personality there. I read commercials on air. I did the research. I answered the phones. I ran the Dillette boards. I helped pick music for the week. I, I, got coffee. I got nail polish and dry shampoo for Angie Martinez if she needed it. Like I did everything for that station. I would even come in two in the morning uh, and take over the night shifts and basically be in the station by myself, 19, 20 years old in alone in the station running the whole, like what everybody's hearing on the radio. I was running that two in the morning. That's epic. Yeah. And uh, so I ended up dropping out of school because I was taking this really seriously. I really just wanted to take my shot and wanted to be on hot 97 and, and I'd make my money because the station wasn't paying me. I'd make my money at night, 
uh, hosting underground rapper showcases and I would sell tickets with the other up and coming DJs and we'd run these events and we'd have uh, online radio shows outside of the station where some of the DJs now who are really popular, like DJ Drewski, DJ Juanito, they were on shows with me where I was the personality like Angie and they were doing the music and, and DJing. And I would interview celebrities like Soldier Boy, Fabulous, like all these different celebrities, bring them on my online radio show. At one point, I was uh, running DJ Enough's blog site. He's a big personality. And then doing like vlogs where I would interview like uh, celebrities and, and the personalities of the station. And I was being branded as, as Hala from Hot 97. And three years into it, um, you know, my family was giving me a lot of pressure. All of my siblings were in medical school on track to become doctors. Mm. I have three siblings. I also have a family that lives down the street that are my cousins, three cousins that were almost like my siblings and all of them were in medical school. So could you imagine me being Thanksgiving dinner, seven of my, like three of my siblings, uh, three of my cousins, everyone is in medical school except for me. And I'm like, yeah, I work oh at a God. hip hop radio station and I don't get <laughs> paid and I dropped out of school. And so I was the black sheep and I was kind of like a party girl. I was partying at night, hanging out with celebrities. I dated Chris Brown for a, a few months. Wow. And so like uh, my family was worried for me. They, they really yeah. thought that I was going down the wrong path, that I was throwing my life away and um, the only person who was really supportive was actually my father. And my father was like, oh, you're a star. I always knew you're going to be a star. Don't worry about it. Uh, just keep doing whatever you're doing. And he was really supportive. And everybody else was just super worried about me. So that's 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 the uh, story behind the black sheep. <laughs> interesting. Interesting. And you did that. You'd had unpaid internship for three years. And yeah. then you had another one for three years. Did you? Is that correct? Two internships? No. So, so I had was... an inter yeah. So I had an internship at Hot 97 for yeah. three years. A paid job opened up. So I'll tell you the story about how I got fired. Okay. So a paid job opened up. They ended up hiring somebody who worked in the video department who was a couple years older than me. It was to be the producer of the Angie Martina show, which I was already doing. I was doing all yeah. the research for the show, all the prep, all the I was doing the producer's job. The producer was incompetent. And they wanted me to train the new guy how to do my, how to be the producer right. and still not pay me. And I got, and the guy was my friend. Um, he was actually my friend. I was friends with everybody at the station. So I texted him one morning and I said, Hey, I don't feel good today. I'm pretty, I'm, I'm, I'm not feeling well. If you want to learn to be the producer, learn it on your own. And I texted him that. And I basically flaked and played hooky that day for work. Angie was so pissed off. She showed her the text and she fired me. She cut my key cards. She said nobody could talk to me anymore. She didn't let me go get my stuff. She told all the DJs that they can't even answer my calls anymore. They I don't know if they may have been just trying to teach me a lesson because I was so tight with everybody there. They, I was like their little like cousin, you know what I mean? And I did everything for them. So they may have been trying to teach me a lesson. Um, but to me, I was like, damn, like, I'm fired. I'm devastated. This is, this is my dream job. I literally felt like somebody died. Um, it was like my identity had been torn away from me because I had branded myself as Hala from Hot 97. Everybody from college knew me as Hala who dropped out of school because she's working at Hot 97, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, it was just part of my identity. So I ended up uh, getting fired and by Sunday, I got fired on a Thursday. By Sunday, I had thought of a new idea and started working on it. And it was called the sorority of hip hop, strawberryblunt.com. And essentially it was going to be a blog site where I would recruit other women in the entertainment industry and hip hop industry who were being, uh, you know, not given opportunities to succeed and who felt like they were being held back. And it was a way for us to band together and create a platform to elevate each other. And so on Sunday, like I said, I got fired on Thursday, four days later, I'm, I'm learning how to build WordPress websites. I've built a website. I went on Craigslist and Twitter. I started recruiting girls. I said, Hey, I'm looking for girls to join the sorority of hip hop. If you're pretty, if you know how to write, if you want to learn how to blog, if you want to have a community, uh, join my movement, here's how you apply. I had an application 
Uh, two weeks later, I had my first meeting with my 14 girls that I had recruited. <laughs> Three months later, we were one of the biggest hip hop and entertainment news sites in the world. And we even got scouted by MTV for a little pilot. Mm. Um, what happened was, is that I had hacked Twitter. Um, at the time, um, I figured out how to make it so that every time we wrote a blog, we would add a celebrity and it would get pushed out on Twitter on all of these girls profiles. So it'd be like 50 girls tweeting out Drake. Drake would retweet, retweet us. And nobody else was doing this at the time. Now everybody does this on Twitter. We were the first ones to do this. Mm -hmm. So all these celebrities started to retweet us. Some of them were familiar with me from my hot 97 days. And so we just blew up really quickly and um, it was just amazing. I went back to school at this time as well. Mm. That's uh, you have, you have a work ethic. You, I don't know what it is with you, New Yorkers, you East coast, you guys have a <laughs> hustle. You, you got to give it to some of the people on the West coast because it's just, <laughs> there's, there's like this hustle energy that you guys have out there. It's, I mean, you have to, it's so yeah. cutthroat. It's like, yeah. if you don't hustle, you die, you know? I so know, I, I love it. Yeah. And so this, this website blew up. And what's funny is that the same DJs who, you know, wouldn't pay me minimum wage and things like that. They started calling me up to host parties with them. So mm -hmm. all of a sudden I was hosting parties with the biggest DJs in New York, Funk Master Flex, DJ Camille, the guys I used to get coffee for were now paying me to promote their parties. And I was on the flyers with them side by side and, and getting shouted out more on the radio than I did when I actually worked there. So all of a sudden I skipped from intern to peer, you know, me and Angie made up all that kind of stuff. And it's just, it was just amazing. Um, so the sorority of hip hop, I'll tell you how it ended. Um, so like I said, MTV scouted us for a pilot in the beginning. It didn't work out, but we didn't really care. Cause it was just three months in where I was like, okay, MTV wanted us what's going to happen next. So we kept chugging along. We had online radio shows that we had a blog, we'd host events, then three years down the line, MTV came back to me and they said, we're serious this time. You're going to get at your show. They got us a studio on Broadway. They filmed us the entire summer. I was the lead. It was right after Jersey Shore ended. I literally thought I was going to be the next Snooki, and I was happy to be the next Snooki at that time. I was, <laughs> what was I like 27 or whatever? And I, I was like, sure, <laughs> let's do this, you know? And so um, it didn't work out. They ended up pulling the plug. They basically shot a whole season and, and they couldn't give me a reason. And it was another one of those times where I felt like I had lost my identity and I had to start over from zero. So my journey has been a lot of ups and downs. Yeah. Wow. There's a, there's a lot you can learn from that. And, you know, what you said earlier, what I really resonated with is how your dad was your biggest supporter. Yeah. And I feel like, you know, when you have a dream that's different than the rest, it's, it's so important to have somebody that believes in you and that sees that in you, you know, and I believe that's what makes a great leader or a great coach or great. Anybody is like somebody that can see past you know, a lot of it and just understand that what you have within you may be different and to help you bring that bright light and shine brighter. And it's, it's so important. So I was going to say like, how did you end up getting through all that when nobody believed in you, but your dad did, which is so powerful. Yeah. I'm lucky that he did. Cause I'm not sure that I would have stayed on that path had I had nobody mm -hmm. in my family that supported me, even like in a financial perspective, I was being, I was making a little bit of money, but without my dad believing in me, and then I don't know if it would have been possible mm. just like, even from a financial perspective. So yeah, I really appreciate that. I mean, my dad was amazing. Thank mm. God. <laughs> yeah. And you know, it's never easy to lose them. Um, I lost my dad about what is it at the summer of 2017? And I know you just recently, oh. you just lost yours as well. And this, this is a never an easy process, you know, and it's, there's no rule book for how to process loss. You know, we can compartmentalize it and use it to drive us, which, you know, is really what I think a lot of us do, but there's also a sense of, of having to give it space. Yeah. And, you know, cause I do a lot of, you know, personal development, a lot of healing. I've done a lot of work from psychedelics to all kinds of shit. Like, and 
it's, it's just been so important for myself to give it that space that it needs to process. Right. And I guess where I want to go with this and ask you is like, how have you, for somebody listening out there also that may have going through loss, because there's been a lot, especially last year and such a yeah. fucking crazy situation that we've dealt with, with not being able to see people and that, how have you processed it the last year? And maybe walk us through a little bit of like, what has helped you to get through this stuff? Yeah. Oh my gosh. So my dad died May 15th, 2020. He actually died from COVID and it was a really traumatic death. Like couldn't see him or visit him in the hospital. He was in the hospital for like six weeks on a ventilator. He couldn't see, he couldn't talk. I just watched my dad die for six weeks literally. And it was just terrible. I the last time I saw like the only time we got to see him in the hospital was after he died. So my whole thing was like, I had this traumatic image of my dead father that like wouldn't get out of my head, you know, and like, mm. just like traumatic images of him suffering and just not being able to get it out of my head. So that was tough. The other thing was tough is that like, because it was COVID, he was so alone. Like, like I said, we couldn't visit him in the hospital, visit him in the hospital, but like even the nurses, like compared to a normal person, how they would take care of a normal person when they're dying. It's like my, like people were so afraid, especially back then that like, I felt like he got no care and like was just alone suffering. So like that really, really like hurts, you know, especially because he was like this generous, amazing man who put all his nieces and nephews through college and gave so much to charity and was his community. He was just such a good guy. And he was a surgeon. He saved many lives himself. So for me, I'm like, geez, is there a God? Like, how could such a good guy go so bad when literally his job was to save lives and then nobody was there to save his life? It makes me sick when I think about it. So that was tough. I feel like on top of just losing someone, I feel like I lost somebody in a really traumatic way. And uh, the other piece that was really tough was his funeral. I mean, at the time we were, we weren't really allowed. He had so many friends and we could have six people at his funeral. They didn't even let us like prepare his body in any way. They, they buried him with his like hospital clothes and with his oh shoes God. and his cell phone and all that shit. And like that to me also was like, Oh, stab me in the heart. Like this guy doesn't deserve this. Right. So really tough. Uh, I think a lot of people would have been stuck. I think a lot of people would have been like, screw life. Nothing matters anymore. You know? And I don't, I can't pinpoint and tell you like, Hey, I don't know. Like, I don't know why I, maybe it was all this ups and downs I've had in my life in the past. You know, I also think that my dad came from nothing. So my dad grew up in Palestine in a room with six people. He grew up on figs and pita bread his whole life, like didn't even have meat that couldn't even afford meat when he was younger, had no electricity, no water. All he had was a, to like the light on his walk to school. He all he cared about was studying because he knew the only way he could get out is to study his way and get scholarships. And so he got a scholarship to college. He got a scholarship to med school. He ended up coming to America, becoming a surgeon, became chief of surgery, had a medical center, and he became super successful and then took all his family out of poverty. So for me, he was always this like role model of like, anything is possible. The American dream is possible. Anything is possible. And I felt like I had no excuse to not be successful. So when he was on his deathbed, I decided to start my marketing agency and go 100% full steam ahead on my dreams. And part of it was because I was like, man, like life is, can end at any second. And my dad did it from nothing. I at least got everything that he built for me as a stepping stone. And I can't just throw this away. And I felt like to make him proud, I've got to go all in and just do this. And while he was in the hospital, I swear, like I started this company and my podcast at the same time also like kind of blew up. It's like everything just blew up all in, in a positive way. I say blow up. I mean, like my yeah. downloads went from 4,000 a month to 15,000 a day type of thing like suddenly. Right. And it was just like all oh, this perfect storm. I started this marketing agency. I had a team of 10 volunteers 
and decided that I was going to start a business with these volunteers and start paying them. And now I'm, you know, a year later, we made almost $2 million in our first year in revenue. And I have 63 paid team members all over the world in, in America, US, Philippines, India, UK. So it's just crazy that I had this uh, enormous amount of growth and it all started uh, when he was in the hospital because I realized um, that there's this, there's this law that Robert Green taught me about called the law of death denial. And when you're in denial of your death, you are unmotivated, uh, less motivated, and you don't realize that your dreams are possible. But once you start to realize that there is death and you're going to die, that it just kicks you into high gear. And so I feel like it just kicked me into high gear. I was super productive before that. I was still consistent and working on my dreams before that, but I feel like it kicked me into high gear and made me truly believe that life is limitless. Hmm. I had some goosebumps when you're telling me that story because, you know, what he achieved, you know, the American dream and being able to create such a amazing life from nothing yet he wasn't given the proper goodbye that he probably should have been yeah and you know i just want to say like thank you for sharing that because you know that's it's important and you know that that says a lot about you know who you are as a person and like what he what you must have learned from him and just the drive and to be successful. And it's just, it is sad because I, I think about the last 18 months or whatever the hell long it's been <laughs> like this craziness and you know, how many people never got that opportunity to just touch the person and just be there and I then know. they end up dying. And it's like, well, they're fucking dying anyways. We might as well just enjoy it. Right. The same thing with a, my grandma. It's the same thing with there's so many. And to have your your dad, and you know, while you're saying that, I I was thinking about my dad when I spent with him his last few hours with him because we found out and he had cancer. I had like five hours with him to watch him die, but at least I got to be there with him and like you know hold him. So, you know, that's got to be tough. And again, it's it takes a lot of courage, and and to be able to speak about that. Right. Yeah. And, and I think, well, I know that when we're able to express that and let it breathe, it is, that gives us a lot of help with the healing process too. And that's what I've noticed is like that vulnerability, when you're able to open up and share that, man, that's when, that's when the gifts, that's when things open up and that's where the healing really helps. And other people hear that and they're like, oh shit, like I'm, I went through that too, or I'm going through that or, um, so yeah, thank you for that. I mean, it's, it's yeah. powerful. And I, I want to say that like, I, to your point, like I think speaking, talking about it, going to therapy for me, it was like LinkedIn was my therapy. I, I poured my heart on, heart on LinkedIn. Like it was my diary. And, and that really helped me just writing out all my feelings and, and all the support that I got from even strangers mm -hmm. to this day. I have people reaching back out to me, like, like men, older men that just want to be like a father figure to me or something along those lines on LinkedIn, who, who are always saying like, Hey, I just want to check up on you make sure you're okay. And it makes me feel so like, wow, there's such nice people in the world. Like, honestly, I feel like a lot of it, that a lot that helped me through was all these strangers on LinkedIn and fans and supporters who were just there for me this whole time and still check up on me. You also serve at a high level and you have for many years, right? So I believe that there is a certain, you get as woo woo as you want. I talk about woo stuff on here. And I personally believe, you know, you, when you give and someone like, you know, I had David Meltzer on and someone like that is just all about giving. Yeah. And I just love it because it's like the more you're able to give, the more you get in the end. Right. And yeah, it's interesting because it doesn't surprise me that you get, you get a ton of support. Because if you're giving and you're adding value and you're just being a, hu a great human, people will, people want to help when you're, when you're in a tough time, you know, especially exactly. when you continue to show up consistently. 
Yeah, I totally agree. I think that part of the reason why people were there for me is because I, for two years, I was there for them. <laughs> and then it was like, oh my gosh, Hall is going through something crazy. Let's make sure she's okay. And, and I don't know, I just really appreciate that. And I love LinkedIn for that reason. I feel like it's just such a great community. It's so much different than other social media sites. Yeah. I mean, my good friend, Shay Robottom, she's crushed it on there too. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, I haven't, I haven't mastered that or even gotten close, but it's, it's great <laughs> to see when, you know, some, when you're able to crack the code and do some amazing things. Cause I've, I've listened to some of your strategies and it's great, but it, again, it's consistency and yes. it's, it's to be able to, what you're able to do and channel that, what you're going through into your craft, you know, like really mm-hmm. go, all right, like this, turn your pain into purpose. Like that's, it's a beautiful thing. That's why we can use our pain. We can use the adversity and really harness it yeah. into this, like into this magic that we can create, you know? And um, there's one other thing I wanted to touch on around what's going on in the world and just how has your feeling about everything and the craziness changed from that? Because there's got to be a certain resentment that you're like to this, because this thing doesn't seem to end. Like it's, you know, and I don't think it's going to end soon. This whole, yeah, everything. So, you know, all of us have had our, I know I have, I've had my stages of how I feel about everything and, you know, and, and, you know, my mindset and my perspective. And I guess what I kind of want to ask you is like, how has your feeling towards everything changed since losing your dad in in a way like that? Like, you know, like, yeah, I know what you mean. I, I know what you mean. You know, some days I get really, like I said, I get really sad and I'm just like, how could this happened? You know, and like, he shouldn't have died so early. And, and like, he was a doctor, so he got it because he was a doctor. And like, why couldn't anybody be safe? And like, like, why are people so stupid? You know, like, why did somebody put my dad in danger type of a thing? Right. And you start to play the blame game. Like, who's the one that got my dad sick? How did this all happen? Right. And that's not healthy. What I need to realize is that like everything happens for a reason. It was his time. It's terrible what happened, but I hope that he's in heaven and and knows that everybody tried their hardest and it was like just this crazy time. And we all wish we were there with him, you know, and I feel like he has to be proud of everything going on. And every time I talk about my success, I attach my dad's name to it. So I feel like my legacy is his legacy. And I hope that makes him proud that I feel that way. Cause I truly feel that way. I feel if I didn't have my dad as a father, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be successful as successful as I am. I wouldn't have had the role model. I wouldn't have had the grit. I think that he instilled all of that in me. And, um, so I just try to be positive. I think that when like, the best thing that you could be is positive. Like negativity is toxic, you know? And I just channeled all this pain, like you said before, into purpose. And I just decided that I was going to be super successful. And so 2020 was the worst year of my life. And it was the best year of my life. I always say that. And there was a lot of blessings that came out of COVID that helped me start my my business. So I started Young and Profiting Podcast as a side hustle three and a half years ago while I was working at HP. Then I went to Disney Streaming Services and uh, spent two years at Disney Streaming Services. About a little over a year ago when my dad was in the hospital, that's when I started my marketing agency. Previous to that, my podcast was doing well. I was growing my brand on LinkedIn, but I wasn't really monetizing yet. And my podcast wasn't huge. You know, now I think I have a pretty huge podcast before it wasn't that it was like decent. And I was a a LinkedIn influencer. Right. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to promote my podcast, but it wasn't really working and I wasn't monetizing. Now, once I started the marketing agency, the only reason why I had time to start an agency while working full time was because everyone was working from home. Right. So I had no commute. So all of a sudden I had two extra hours a day that I never had. Plus, because we're working from home, it's a little bit more flexible. I could work like right up until my meetings. I could work during lunch and nobody could say anything. I, as long as I got my work done, that's all that mattered. Right. And so all of a sudden I had unlocked all this time. 
the other reason why I had more time is because I got COVID. I took care of my dad while he was sick and I ended up getting COVID myself. So I had to quarantine. And at that time, I was one of the first people who got COVID. So everyone was scared of hanging out with me. My friends wouldn't. So on top of losing my dad, it's like nobody, my boyfriend, uh, who's not my boyfriend anymore, basically was scared to hang out with me. My friends were scared to hang out with me. Everybody was scared of COVID. So I was so isolated. All I had was my remote team, my podcast, my job and social media. So I was like, okay, screw it. (laughs) I'm going to go all in. Right. And I had all, so I had all this free time. So it ended up being a blessing because without that, I would have been stuck in the rat race of every day going on the train to New York and wasting all my time and going out with friends. And no, I had three, four months of isolation essentially, and a lot more time. And so I started a business. Then my business is what enabled me to, to, uh, create my dream becoming like a number one podcaster, because all of a sudden I got the funds. Uh, landing these clients one after the other, being able to uh, hire my volunteer team as proper employees. And all of a sudden I had a marketing team that, you know, the same type of a marketing team that a CEO who's making a hundred million dollars a year is able to hire. So Mm -hmm. I got that those perks where my team was working on my podcast and marketing. And all of a sudden I had so much more resources. I could invest in media buying. I can invest in somebody to shoot out my guest emails to, um, you know, help me get sponsors, whatever it is. And I scaled everything really fast and, um, started monetizing my show and basically fueling my dream. So like I said, 2020 best and worst year of my life, because it actually unlocked a lot of time. And the key is that I didn't just, I wasn't just sad and was like, Oh, all right, I'll just watch TV and be depressed. I said, no, I'll be productive and start a business and, and make my dad proud. Mm, amazing. So for people that think that you have it all figured out, like, cause you know, on the outside, they probably go, oh, she's, it's been easy, but they don't know. They only see the iceberg. They don't see everything like that, like the, the past, but so you, you have all these things figured out. You got massive, successful podcasts, great business. You've had amazing guests, Matthew McConaughey, to name one of them, which is fucking awesome, by the way. <laughs> um, but I want to ask you an honest question. And for the people that are listening that think you have it all figured out, what is your biggest weakness that you are working on Ooh. today? Um, all right. I'll give you a couple because I think everybody has weaknesses. So one is I'm always late. I have, and it's a blessing and a curse. Cause I think, I actually think all your weaknesses are sometimes your biggest strengths. I agree. I think they directly correlate. So I'm always late, but it's because I'm extremely optimistic. So I'm the type of person that thinks I can do a million things. I know that I have to be somewhere like I'm six minutes late to you. Right. I know that I have to be somewhere, but I'm thinking I could take this call. I could do this. I could do that. This, uh, And I always assume that things are going to take shorter than they will. And it's because yeah. I'm very optimistic, but I would never want it to. I'm, I'm OK with that. I'll be five minutes late to everything. Just let me stay positive. I'd rather be positive. I think a lot of people who are always on time are very negative people. If you notice, mm, that's interesting. It's true. I'm, I'm usually late, too. So I'm like, yes. All right. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> for the late just, people. Just try to think about all the people who are usually on time or early. They're really pessimistic people because they That's assume that there's going to be traffic. They assume that there's going to be like something bad that happens uh, to, before they get there. So just so I think that's definitely a weakness. Mm-hmm. Um, what else is a weakness? I mean, I just need to be better under stress. I, I'm it might not even be a weakness. I just think I'm in a very stressful situation. So my team grew from 10 volunteers to 63 paid team members in one year. Mm, I wow. now ha- manage 12 huge high profile clients like Brit Marin of Britain Co, Kara Golden, the CEO of Hint Waller, Hint Water, the CEO of 1-800 Got Junk, like all their social media, all their podcasts. It's a lot, you know, and it just managing all these people and, and trying to keep a cool, like be cool as a cucumber when things go wrong. And I think I could be better at managing my stress. I think that sometimes I get super stressed out. Um, but I, I am in a stressful situation. I have a startup that's really blowing up 
And mm. um, so I, I want to learn how to manage my stress, but stress better. I want to get into meditation. Mm. Meditation is something that I've, I've had a million episodes on and I never do it. You're talking to the right person. That's literally okay. my entire, like, yeah, it's changed my entire life. Like I never meditate. And oh I think that is God. probably so bad. <laughs> it's not bad, but I promise you this. It will change your life in such a big way. I don't know if you follow Dr. Joe Dispenza. Mm -mm. Okay. You, there, there's you got to start. He okay, is wait, make an intro. I'll have him on my show if he's great. Well, yeah, he's uh, yeah, absolutely. You, I'm sure you, with your size of audience, you could get him, but he's, he's a, he's a big name. He's definitely worth looking into. I was just at his seven day retreat in Denver. And I mean, you can't, sometimes you can't quantify it in words, you know, and but I know everybody says that everybody who meditates is like, oh, you're missing out. And I'm sure I am. I just it's so hard to slow down. And I know yeah. that I have to to speed up, you know, the well, best you way get to clarity. Stuff. This is the thing is you get clarity for your craft and your mission. When you're able to connect to yourself, your higher self, you're able to take away the external environment and you're able to tap in things quiet down and you're able to tap in your intuition easier things just get a little bit clear and it buys you almost like a couple extra seconds in life. Mm. You know, for somebody why I, I can really relate to it is that I'm very, I used to be very reactive, very like responsive and reactive. Now what it does for me is it like gives me this like extra time to sort of sit back and be more in the driver's seat versus like the reactor in the passenger seat. And mm. it's, it's, it's helped me so much being a very, you know, I, I was, I was a very alpha male athlete. I was in the nightclub industry for many years, very like complete opposite of anything to do with meditation. But what it's done <laughs> is it's allowed me to like really create this more well-rounded human within myself and to kind of tap into that energy that may people, some people may say is silly or whatever, but I believe the people that say that need it the most. So I, yeah, I definitely encourage you. And I'm glad we're having this conversation about this because it really will just, it'll just strengthen that muscle and just make you better at all the things that you need to do. You know, I totally agree. Is there an <laughs> app that you recommend? Um, yeah, there's a, there's a few that we, I mean, I would go look at Dr. Joe Dispenza's work first, because okay. what he does is he talks about, he basically takes a mystical concept and combines it with science so that you can actually see the benefit of what a state of gratitude does to your brain. You can measure, you can measure like what it's doing electronically. You can, it's really fascinating. So if anybody that needs the science behind it, anybody, the non-believers, it's pretty hard to not believe when you see science, right? And what happens yeah. when you open your heart? And if you're able to get to a state where your heart is open, that is the, the spot where you're able to manifest more and connect to different into your higher self. So there's just a lot of science around like brain waves and how things change when you're in these states. And um, I would highly recommend him because he explains it in a way that's easily digestible. And it takes this sort of woo woo concept and makes it a, a lot easier to understand with science. No, so, I'm excited to check that out. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> I'm glad that we got into that. Um, yeah. I just, I get so excited about meditation. So it's, it's, I mean, everybody who meditates does, I'm like, what am I waiting for? I just need like time. I, I need yeah. to slow down a little. Yeah, definitely. Um, if, yeah, I know we got to wrap things up. I know you got to get going. So there, I want to make sure that we leave the audience here with a little something personal from you. So if you, if, if you, if somebody's out there and there's lots people struggling with their own different things, their own adversity, whether it's loss, whether it's, um, I don't know, anger, whatever it is. If somebody's out there and they're just, and you could give them a little bit of advice, a tool, tip, resource that they could walk away with that's helped you with overcoming adversity, mm -hmm. what would that be? Yeah. Um, it would be that when a gatekeeper is telling you, no, you need to create your own path. So I look back and I think the best thing I ever did was to start the brand Young and Profiting Podcast, which I owned. And most of the adversity that I faced in life was trying to do something that I didn't own. 
So trying to make it on, trying to be in the talent show that was ran by the high school where there was a gatekeeper who didn't like me or trying to be on Hot 97 where they wouldn't hire me. There was a gatekeeper telling me no or the MTV show and it was a producer telling me no or I was going to be the Global Young Employee Network at Hewlett Packard, the president of the Global Young Employee Network. I had deserved it. I had been the president of my local chapter, all this stuff. The HR person didn't like me. She told me no. And then I started to realize that like, wow, all these things that I've been working towards, I don't own. And if I was my own gatekeeper, that means I could do whatever I want. Nobody could tell me no. I just build it myself, right? And so that's the thing that changed. And the reason why I won this time was because I wasn't waiting for somebody to open a door. I wasn't just knocking on different doors and being like, please, please, you know, give me a chance. I decided that I was going to do it myself and that my success and failure would be my own choices Mm -hmm. and under my control. And so when you're in a situation and you're, it's the gatekeepers telling you no, but you have the fire inside, you have the passion inside, you want to make it. You need to be brave and try to do it on your own. Even if that means you have to start small, start 10 hours a week, just start small. I started young and profiting with 12 hours a week. Mm. And now I'm a number one education podcast. I've interviewed Matthew McConaughey. I've, I'm making, you know, so much money just off my podcast. I started an agency. I'm running a team of 63. I got to quit my corporate job. I'm doing it on my own. It's my brand. I own it hundred percent. And it's because I decided to do it on my own and not just try to fit in somebody else's plan because you never know why those people are telling, you, no, they could have a bad day. They could just not like you. They could have personal reasons. Like they could have biases. If it's on your own, you have the control. So just be brave to to do stuff on your own when you have the fire and the passion inside of you. And when you want something, don't let somebody don't not go on your path just because somebody told you no. Just do it on your own. Mic drop, ladies and gentlemen. Mic drop. <laughs> that was awesome. Thank, Thank you so you. much. That's it's so true. And having that level of belief, you know, because there's gonna be a lot of no's. There's gonna be a lot of, you know, shit talkers and haters and all the things. And I love that because yeah, the, you can't let those gatekeepers stop you. And exactly. It's, it's beautiful. And, you know, thank you for everything that you shared today. Thank you for, it's really inspiring to be able to see somebody that has been able to, especially recently overcome what you have and, and create such great success. I truly thank you so much. It's, it's, it's really important to share that. And I'm glad that the listeners are going to get to uh, get, get that into their lives. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Hala. Thank you, Lance. This is a wonderful conversation. You did a great job. I, I see a bright future ahead of ahead for you in this oh, space. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, I just love these conversations and just, man, the deeper, the better. So if so, do you have do you have anything coming out that we can send everybody? I know your podcast, Young and Profiting Podcast. Is there anything else that we can look forward to coming out a book? I know you got a book in you for sure. I'm going to be writing a book in the next year or so. Uh, so looking forward to that. But I mean, honestly, guys, I pour my heart and soul into this podcast. It is such a great show. Check out Young and Profiting Podcasts on your favorite app, Apple, Spotify, CastBox, wherever. I'm also on LinkedIn. We, we post great content on there on Instagram at Yap with Hala. If all else fails, you could go to youngandprofiting.com. Um, always on Clubhouse. Happy to connect. DM me if you found me on this show. I'd love to talk to my fans and uh, listeners. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Hal. I really appreciate Thank it. You. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Woo! What a powerful conversation. You guys, make sure to go follow Hala on social media. Go check out her podcast, obviously, Young and Profiting. She's killing it. Also, you guys, if you got value from this, Share this with a friend or tag us on social media. Or if you really want to support the show, leave us a review on Apple. It's so greatly appreciated. I really want to get more reviews on there. Um, Also, you guys, don't forget the 30-day challenge. Unlock the warrior within. Let's go back to basics together, you guys. Let's go back to the fundamentals, the daily routine, the evening routine. Let's do this thing together. Let's work together, empowering ourselves Join the Facebook group. Like I said, 
daily videos in the Facebook group to keep you on track. And as always, unlocking that true warrior spirit and embodying that starts with the simple things. How important is your goals? How important is your life? It all starts with the basics. Unlock the Warrior Within Challenge. Link is in the description or the show notes, wherever you're watching this or listening to this. And you guys, much love. We will catch you next time.